thank you, Father Yahweh, for this day that you have made for yourself that we should worship you. We should uh, praise your holy name. We should uh, 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 rejoice uh, for you. Glory be to your holy name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Holy Spirit, for your faithfulness uh, that you are always there to, 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 to feed us with the bread of life each and every day. Uh, that alone is a privilege. Even today, the scripture uh, that you gave us, Acts, Acts 5, verses 28 to 29, I read, saying, did not we strictly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled the Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We are to obey God rather than men. End of quote. This is the word of God. The, the Lord brought us today to teach us about civil obedience, civil disobedience, civil disobedience. As always, when I want the Holy Spirit to tell me his mind on specific issues, I inquired of him on the pressing issues facing our families and countries. After, after casting lots on the Bible, which is my preferred Urim and Tumim, the, the Spirit of Yahshua Christ gave me this scripture as his divine answer to my prayer to mark my question, Acts 5 verses 28 to 29. The first uh, 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 part of this presentation is what he said in that scripture, the last, uh, the last sentence. We ought to obey God rather than men. This was the apostles Peter and John and the other apostles who joined them this, uh, the second day, this was their testimony to Christ before the Judean council, which was called the Sanhedrin, which was the local, uh, lo local, govern go the local government of Judea under Roman colonization and occupation. If your country, one way or another, is still colonized directly or indirectly by a world superpower. The scripture given me by the Holy Spirit, this Yade applies to your country. And I believe that it applies to my country, Cameroon. That is, that is already in a constitutional crisis which has torn, turn, turned to to civil war in part of the country, the English-speaking country, uh, side of the country. And now it is in an electoral crisis, which is, which can uh, 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 spiral tomorrow, as the results are going to be read to, to keep the 36th year reigning a president who is still there since 36 years with uh, a lot of election rigging, a lot of frauds that are going to be, to be, to be maintained. The Sanhedrin members ordered the arrest of the apostles while they were preaching the gospel in the temple. To avoid the potential stoning by the people who showed great attention and interest in the apostles' preach, the temple officials decided to use tact instead of force to summon the apostles. Like these Sanhedrin 
who rulers who had just got Yeshua Christ crucified and killed. Many will do an evil thing with, with daring, yet cannot bear to hear of it afterward or to have it charged upon them. The ruling Sadducees, you know the Sadducees, they didn't believe that their spirits exist. Heaven resurrection did not exist. And they were the one ruling the, the, the greatest party and the, the ruling party holding holding the the, the, the seat of the, the high priest uh, in the Sanhedrin. So the ruling Sadducees weren't happy that the apostles had ignored their warnings to quit talking about uh, Christ as uh, uh, they, 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 we see it in uh, in uh, in Acts 4 verses 18 and 21. So this time they had a large group arrested and jailed, even the 12 apostles. Luke records their real motive, indignation, indignation between courts or jealousy. Clearly, Yahweh was at work among the believers in Yahshua. And all the Sadducees could not do, all the, all this, the, all, and all the Sadducees could do was to just to observe, to observe and complain uh, as outsiders. The apostles were supposed to be in prison overnight, but their sentence was commuted by an angel who released them miraculously. Rather than take the opportunity to hide or escape, the apostles follow the angel's orders to go to the temple and tell the people about the gospel. The truly miraculous aspect of the apostles' prison break is that no one knew they were gone. The cells were still locked and the guards were still in their posts. It wasn't until the Sanhedrin assembled and sent for the apostles that they were discovered missing. Someone finally had to tell the council that the apostles were teaching and healing the sick in the temple courts, one of the most public places in Jerusalem. There is no prison so dark so strong that Yahweh can visit his people in it and if it if he pleases fetch them out the scripture says saying did not we straightly command you and of course or give you strict orders with severe threatenings did not we straightly expresses that 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 uh, uh, that expression expresses intensity. They mean to say, commanding. We commanded you. Did we not command you with a threat? It is the characteristics. It is the characteristic of tyrants. To set down their own commandments as right and proper, be they ever so wicked. And the scripture says that you should not teach in this name, and of course, they go at once to that which is the great offense in their eyes, the name of Yahshua of Nazareth whom they knew to have been crucified, but who was proclaimed to be alive again, and whose followers manifested such mighty works, was the object against which their power was directed. And the scripture says, Ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and of put better with your teaching, this though not so desired was an honorable tribute 
to the zeal and fidelity of the apostles. When chastens are arraigned or persecuted, it is well if the only charge with which their enemies can bring against them is that they have been distinguished for zeal and success in propagating Christianity. And the scripture says, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us, end of quote, better, and you wish to bring this man's blood on us. They mean, they say something like, make us guilty and you, t you intend to make us guilty of murdering that man's, oh, that man's whom yet they will not condescend to name. To bring, I quote, one's blood, end of quote, upon another is a phrase signifying to hold or to prove him guilty of murdering the, the innocent. The expression here charges them with desiring to prove that they had put Yahshua to death when he was innocent. To convince the people, the people between court of this and thus to enrage them, to enrage the people against the Sanhedrin and also to prove that they were guilty and were exposed to the divine vengeance for having put the Messiah to death. They shun not the sin of murder, but are afraid, are, are afraid or ashamed of the imputation of it as many scruple not to commit that wickedness which they would be loved to be thought guilty of blood the punishment of his blood shedding blood blood shedding shedding it is a marvelous spectacle to see the judges take the place of culprits and deprecate accusation where they would naturally be, de be dealing at penalties. But the invocation of the people before Christ the crucifixion, I quote, his blood be upon us and upon our children, end of quote, in Matthew 27 verse 25, was felt by the council to be likely to be brought to fulfillment. And that is what they feared the most. And the scripture says, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, end of quote, the whole company of the, the twelve apostles, it must be remembered, were now the objects of attack. And they, and they all accepted Peter as their spokesman. And the scripture ends by saying, we are to obey God rather than men, end of quote. This is said in answer to the charge of disobedience to the orders and commands of the governing council. Men, presidents, government officials, magistrates, and ecclesiastic rulers are to be obeyed in things which are not repugnant to the will of Yahweh. But in things that are Yahweh is to be, to be obeyed and not men. Yahweh has commanded by an angel that the apostles should go to the temple and there preach the doctrines of the gospel. The Sanhedrin had forbid them to speak and teach in the name of Yahshua Christ. Who were now to be obeyed? Who were now to be obeyed? The answer is unequivocally God rather than men. Yahweh rather than, 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 than men. From whence it appears that the apostles, apostles were 
to be justified in the disregarding the council and neglecting its orders, which is, which is no ways contrary to that obedience and submission that is to be yielded to those that are in authority in things civil and lawful. Not that the apostles did not plead the power they had to work miracles, a power which spoke sufficiently for them and proved their divine mission. And therefore they humbly de declined mentioning it themselves. But they appealed to, the mark, to a maxim universally known and universally owned to which heaven reason must subscribe and which was a perfect justification of their conduct. Yahweh had commanded them to teach in the name of Christ and therefore they were in duty, in duty, bound to do it. So the chief priests forbade them. We should obey man only in so far that in obeying him, we also obey God Yahweh. Otherwise, we should obey God only, not man. Second leg of this presentation, Yahweh allows to disobey government. The question is, when is, civil, when is civil disobedience allowed for a Christian? Because what, uh, what the apostles did, saying they do not obey them, is disobedience by them all assembled and by all the Christians, that is civil disobedience. The Emperor of Rome from 54 to 68 after Christ was Nero Claudius Kaiser Augustus Germanicus, also known simply as Nero. The Emperor was not known for being a godly person and engaged in a variety of and engaged in a variety of illicit acts homosexual marriage being among them. In 64, the great Roman fire occurred, occurred with Nero himself being suspected of arson. arson. He was sub, sub, suspected of that arson. In his writings, the Roman senator and historian Ta, Tacitus recorded, I quote him, to get rid of the report that he had started the fire, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the Pope, the populace, and of good. This is in his books, Annals 15. It was during the reign of Nero that the Apostle Paul wrote his epistle to the Romans. While one might, one might expect him to encourage the Christians in Rome to rise up against their oppressive rulers, in chapter 13 we find him requiring total submission to the ruling authorities in Romans 13 verses 1 to 7. Even under the reign of a ruthless and godless emperor who finally martyred, martyred, he martyred him, Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells his readers to be in subjection to the government. Moreover, he states that no authority exists other than that established by God and that the rulers are serving God in their political office. Peter, another apostle that was martyred by the Romans, wrote nearly the same thing in one of his two New Testament letters it's in 1 Peter 2 verses 13 to 17. Both Paul's and Peter's teachings have led to quite a few questions from Christians 
where civil disobedience is concerned. Do Paul and Peter mean that Christians are always to submit to whatever the government commands, no matter what is asked of them? There are at least three general positions on the matter of civil disobedience. The anarchist, the anarchist view says that a person can choose to disobey the government whenever he likes and whenever he feels he is personally justified in doing so. Such a stance has no biblical support whatsoever as evidenced in the writings of Paul in Romans 13. The, extra, the, second, the second position, the extremist, extremist patriot says that a person should always follow or, and obey his country, no matter what the command. This view also does not have biblical support either. Moreover, it is not supported in the history of nations. Then the, the third, and even in, during the, the Nuremberg, Nuremberg trial, the attorneys of the Nazi war criminals attempted to use the defense that their clients were only following the direct orders of the government and therefore could not be held responsible for their actions. However, one of the judges dismissed their argument with the simple question, I quote, but gentlemen, is there not a law above our laws? And of course, he meant the law of God. The position the scripture uphold is one that this is the third position. The position the scriptures uphold is one of biblical submission with a Christian being allowed to act in civil disobedience to the government if such government commands, commands evil such that it requires a Christian to act in a manner that is contrary to the clear teachings and requirements of Yahweh's word which is the case the Holy Spirit brought us today with Acts 5 verses 28 to 29, to 29. There are many examples of the believers' civil disobedience, civil disobedience actions in the Bible. In Egypt, the midwives disobeyed Pharaoh and I quote, feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys leave, end of quote. In Exodus 1 verse 17, in Joshua 2, Rahab directly disobeyed a command from the king of Jericho to produce the Israelite spies. The people resisted. Also, the, uh, another example, the people resisted King Saul and his command to kill and saved his son Jonathan from being put to death in 1 Samuel 14 verse 45. Another example in 1 Kings 18 when the Queen Jezebel was killing Yahweh's prophet Obadiah, a man who, I quote, feared the Lord greatly, and of quote, took a hundred of them and hid them from her so they could leave, and many more. What conclusions can be drawn from the above biblical examples? The guidelines for a Christian's civil disobedience can be summed up as follows. I have listed five. First, Christians should resist a government that commands or compels evil and should work non-violently within the laws of the land to change a government that permits evil. Second, civil disobedience is permitted when the government's laws and commands are in direct violation of God's laws and commands. Third, if a Christian disobeys an evil government, unless he can flee from the government, he should accept that government's punishment for his actions. Fourth, 
Christians are certainly permitted to work to install new government leaders within the laws that have been established. And fifth and lastly, Christians are commanded to pray for their leaders and for Yahweh to intervene in his time to change any ungodly path that they are pursuing. The scripture says, I quote, First of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And of course, this is quoting First Timothy 2 verses 1 to 2. Hear this and know this and the Lord Yahweh will bless you. Let us take this